innovation of peer production is that we combine, I think something that has not been done before, we combine the freedom of self-aggregation in the production process <coughs> with a new type of NGOs, the FLOSS foundations, the, the open source foundations, that manage the infrastructure of cooperation, but they no longer direct the production processes. They just manage and protect the infrastructural commons that is needed for this cooperation to occur. Uh, I think this is a big social advantage that we can do this, that we uh, can work together outside of the scarcity paradigm, which determines, you know, kind of like a power structure, we decide what we can do and what we cannot do. Now, um, um, this is a, maybe an interesting anecdote. Uh, some of you know that last April I was invited in the, in the Vatican uh, for four days, and uh, this is the longest lasting hierarchical organization in the world um, of these 1500 years, right, of, in, of non-interrupted non uh, hierarchy. Um, and the interesting thing was the, my lecture was about peak hierarchy. And uh, I want to say a little bit about that because I think it's very important and basically, this is what this is about, right? It's about, uh, okay, a, a little history, the way I see it is, okay, as long as we are in tribes, groups of people, small groups of people, where we know each other, we can trust each other, right? And the cost of communicating in a small group is, is not very high. So we can call, call each other up, we can send an email, we can you know, go to the corner of the street and, and knock on your door, so we can have a particular type of relationship that is fairly egalitarian, historically speaking. If you look at tribal communities, you know, the, the layers are very, very limited. You have elders, you have a shaman, you have a war, a war chief. Uh, but basically, it's, it's a fairly horizontal uh, arrangement. Um, and then Dunbar uh, says, based on the research, that when we reach 150 people in the community, we can no longer manage these relationships and we simplify through hierarchy, all right? And this brings the, the coordination, transaction, and combination cost in the community down. Now, historically what happens is that whenever one community, one tribe, chooses the hierarchical way in our physical world, it becomes stronger. A federation of tribes is stronger than a single tribe. A kingship uh, or a big man arrangement is stronger than an isolated uh, tribe. Uh, a big empire is stronger than a kingdom, etc., etc. Right. So the whole of history basically is that even if we would like to have a more equal arrangement, with, let's say within our group, faced with a threat from the, a competitive threat from the outside, we always had to choose to do the same thing, basically. So this was a, a big kind of a big uh, limitation on social change. And of course what we are arguing is that because we now have these kinds of infrastructures emerging, we are really talking about is the global scaling of small group dynamics. That what was used to be limited to time and space, so small communities could meet each other in real, in real life, face to face, these kind of dynamics which allowed peer-to-peer -peer, uh, relationships to occur, cannot globally scale. And if you look at Wikipedia, despite uh, some of its problems, if you look at the Linux operating system, despite some of its problems, essentially what it proves is that we can produce very complex social artifacts by the global scaling of small group dynamics, right? There's no, there's no centralized command and control. There's some forms of leadership, there's some forms of hierarchy, but there is no command and control for the production process of Wikipedia uh, or uh, the various people and, and companies working uh, on the Linux operating system. So, and I think this is uh, quite uh, uh, important because what, what does that kind of indicate? That there is a new model emerging which might combine open communities with distributed physical entities which actually make and produce physical artifacts, right? So, uh, Okay, e Corolla now, which is uh, nobody here from Finland uh, who knows, like e cars now, with a very complicated Finnish name, right? So the idea of, it, of e cars now is that instead of waiting for the company to go hybrid, uh, we share designs so that we, everybody in the world can transform their cars, right? 
and the first project is called eCorolla Now, uh, which is to transform the Corolla into a hybrid Corolla, an electric uh, car. Uh, well, think about it. Once we, once this is done, and it's done, it now exists. Any garage in the world, any small garage in the world, can download the design. And any car owner with a Corolla can go to the garage on Friday evening and get his car transformed on, on a Monday morning, right? So there's no need for a multinational, there's no need for a Prius, there's no patent, which means actually that other companies cannot take over that innovation. Um, there is a distributed network of garages, which even though they're all small by themselves, can actually globally scale into a very powerful network. So this is, I think, what we're talking about today, is how we can achieve this, uh, uh, these modalities. So anyway, so open collaboration spaces, you know, co-working, the hub, we're building those. Uh, open collaboration platforms is a team today. Uh, open technical uh, arrangements like open spectrum and open mobile. Uh, global village infrastructures. Um, Distributed energy, open meeting infrastructure, bar camps, and conferences, <coughs> open space, open funding infrastructures, and open territories. So there's a lot of things happening in terms of these new infrastructures. So that brings us to the fourth uh, element, which is what I call uh, practices of openness. And it's basically so what we are doing there is using these infrastructures to do things differently. Okay, it's sometimes difficult to distinguish uh, things conceptually. Uh, like, like a thing like open money, uh, you can say it's an infrastructure, but it's also a practice, right? So in, in this case, we look more at kind of a practices that use infrastructures, like producing open hardware being based on distributed manufacturing infrastructures. So this is what we're talking about here, is that in different we're starting to do things differently, uh, funding differently, ownership becomes different, use of currencies, designs, software, knowledge, etc. So these are, but these are practices that are that are kind of emerging in every domain of practice. So if you would take something like spirituality, which is uh, quite different from what we talk about today, uh, I have a friend in New Zealand called John Heron. It's called the, Insti the South Pacific Institute for Human Inquiry, and instead of practicing religion, uh, you know, let's say there's a truth that's out there and some people know it, so we kind of follow. He says, okay, let's, let's practice uh, Vipassana for three days, invite a teacher, and then we collaboratively share our experiences. So they built knowledge collectively around shared experiences without, without any, any a priori hierarchical vision of what you know, the truth and meaning is, right? So this is a practice. This is a practice of spiritual inquiry, which is based on peer-to-peer peer -peer uh, ideas, right? Uh, where I come from in Thailand, there is um, an organization, I kind of forgot what it's called right now, but anyway, I'll, I'll explain to you how it works. So these people identify in farming communities productive members. So let's take you have a village and you discover that one person produces twice as much rice as his neighbor, right? Okay, well, they go to him, they will ask him, can you help your neighbors achieve the same time of productivity? Uh, I think they, they might the involve, yeah, now it's called chainfusion.org, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, um, and, and then they kind of not pay the person, but reward them in, a, in some kind of other way by helping them to find scholarships for their children or stuff like that, right? But anyway, so, these people freely contribute to their community, um, and they, you know, it's outside of a market uh, practice. They get rewarded with non-material uh, benefits. They don't get paid for what they do. They help their community, etc. So just to say, that you don't need technology per se to actually think in P2P terms, right? So once that actually we get used to using these things, and these values and these practices, we then, of course, start thinking differently about physical life and the organization of physical life. So those, okay, I'm sure you're familiar with it, the idea of open currencies, of course, is that just as in Facebook we discover that invisible architectures drive our behavior uh, to the benefit of proprietary owners, 
So we can argue that money itself is not a neutral thing, just like the car is not a neutral thing, right? Choosing for individual cars and highways is not a neutral thing, it's not just transport, it's a particular way of conceiving transport. So we can say that money is a particular, as it exists today, is a particular way of conceiving uh, of exchange, and which depends on its design. It's something that we maybe didn't know 20 or 30 years ago. We didn't used to think that way. But now we think that way, and we say, well, maybe we can create our own infrastructure for open currencies, like uh, what's it called, the Metacurrency Project, which aims to be the TCP IP uh, of money and allow different people to create monetary systems that, that, that have different rules. Right? And then they create infrastructure where different, different open currencies can start uh, exchanging with each other and determine the terms of their <coughs> exchange between different communities. All right. So we have these practices, and then the idea is that we start applying them in different domains. So this is what I try to explain with uh, the open spirituality practices. So the idea is that in everything that we do, in every domain that we are active, we start applying <coughs> these values, these charters, these infrastructures and these practices and so we change what we do. So science becomes open science, uh, education becomes open learning, uh, money becomes open money, uh, so we, we apply this, all these things, we apply them in our life in the domains where we are active and in the, in the communities where we are active. And so my argument would be that I don't know of any domain which is not affected by this. Uh, and I think the value, the value of this mind map is, you know, you might think this is a marginal emerging thing, but when you look at the mind map and you start realizing how fast our our, the, world's, the world's structure is changing. This is actually quite amazing, uh, and it's invisible to many people, but it's it's happening. You know, if you if you open your eyes, you, you see it everywhere. Uh, now, if you if you don't know the P2P Foundation Wiki, we have nine thousand pages on open and free participatory and comes oriented practices in all domains of social life. I think bar none. Uh, uh, I think uh, we can go probably we can go to the moon uh, at some point with open uh, open open source rockets, um, uh, right? I'll do it. Yeah. <laughs> we to. Um, okay. So and these of course then are the products of openness that we can now witness like Wikipedia, the Linux operating system, open uh, MIT Open Courseware, and many many things that we actually already can witness as the first emergences. Uh, of that. Now, I have developed, uh, maybe somewhat provocatively, kind of three laws, and maybe they're not real laws, but I think actually we can observe them in many cases. Uh, and I call them the three laws of asymmetric competition. And basically, the first one goes like this um, Any proprietary company that uses proprietary code and has to pay everybody for its development. When it is faced with an open knowledge, open software, or open design community, with these four benefit foundations that manage their infrastructure of, uh, uh, of cooperation, and it's an entrepreneurs which works around the commons, we lose the competitive game. So Britannica, if my law is true, would lose from Wikipedia, and I, I say the proof is in the pudding, yes, Britannica has lost. Explorer would lose from Firefox eventually, right? And of course what, what drives this, uh, this, this law is uh, that no matter how much money you have, right? No matter how much people you can pay, you cannot compete with the whole world, with the whole community, with the whole global community. And also because if you're in a corporate, in a pure corporate environment, innovation and it can only, only be relative. Right? <coughs> you, you innovate to be better than somebody else. As soon as you have a relative monopoly, you don't need to innovate, you stagnate, which is what most companies do. Explorer didn't really evolve for seven years after Netscape collapsed. It, it's only because Firefox came up that then Explorer started evolving again. 
Uh, but think about it, the explorer has to think, okay, what will we change? What should we change? And then it has to, 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 to direct the process and it has to pay these people, it has to find money. While Firefox, anybody in the world can say, I'm going to make a patch because it doesn't work for me in this particular way, so I'm going to make a patch, right? And so con this continuous s striving for absolute quality cannot be obtained by any purely private, private strategy. It just uh, cannot work, right? So the second law is that when two companies are competing with each other and one opens up to this t type of process, it will win from the one that doesn't, right? So this then is very important because it drives even the corporate world to adopt these practices. Of course, in certain ways and according to their interests, but still, they are, they are driven, they're driven by these competitive pressures to move in the same direction driven by the pressure of these open design communities. And I think this is historically very important because whenever we look at phase transitions in the history uh, of humanity, the kind of Marxist scenario where one class takes power and, and takes uh, everything away from the other class just really never happened. Uh, but the scenario whereby pressure from below, slaves escaping at the end of the Roman Empire, uh, the Frankish tribes, whenever they were in front of a Roman city, declaring that the slaves were freed in the city, and all the slaves, all the slaves would free the city. Uh, slaves revolting. Uh, at the same time as the slave owners faced with these pressures, uh, could no longer pay a big army, uh, and then kind of decided, well, maybe the best way to react to that pressure is to actually free the slaves let them work for themselves and, their, and have families, and we'll just take a cut, right? Uh, so in other words, the phase transition only occurred because both the bottom-up <coughs> pressures and, let's say, the coordinating or the managerial classes moved at the same time to a new paradigm, <coughs> which was not to the full advantage of any party, but was kind of an, a mutual adaptation to a new situation. Uh, and the same thing happened with capitalism and feudalism, right? So the paradox of peer production, the paradox of open infrastructures, is that at the same time as we save capitalism, because they can't do it anymore without us, they're dead. Uh, at the same time, they are building and funding the infrastructures that we need for ourselves, right? And then the question becomes is, what do we want? Right? What is the price we're willing to pay to be on Facebook rather than have our own? What is the price we are willing to pay to be on Twitter rather than use Identica, which is a fully uh, independent? Uh, and the answers are not easy. For example, in my case, well, you know, I'm, I like to spread the word about peer-to-peer. -peer. If I stay on Identica, basically nothing happens. <laughs> uh, nobody reads what I'm doing. But if I'm on Twitter, I get lots of retweets and, and, and I influence people. Right? So it's not an easy choice always to decide you know, what, what you should be doing. But in any case, it, uh, what, what, we, what we need to do is, of course, make user communities more aware and conscious of their own differential interests compared to the ones of the platform owners, right? And that doesn't necessarily need to be a very antagonistic relationship, but just, uh, hey guys, this is what we want, and we don't accept this, 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 and this. So, and this becomes a, a new terrain of social struggle and, and, and influence. <coughs> Uh, now, the third law, I should mention it because I think it's important, is I also believe that when two open communities compete with each other, the one that successfully combines itself with an entrepreneurial coalition will be strong than one that doesn't. So, uh, let's say Drupal and Joomla, for example, right? Uh, as one, one example of a competition between two different open communities. Uh, imagine that one would just be on its own, you know, just uh, free contributors. Well, it would have so many issues in terms of sustainability, etc., etc., so that the ones actually who succeed in, in creating these hybrid modalities will actually emerge as the strongest one. And this, this is why we have hybrid uh, systems, right? We don't have pure peer production. We have some kind of a mutual adaptation <coughs> between market forces um, and, and, and peer communities. But I think that because open communities exist, they kind of also change the nature of the marketplace, right? So if you have a strong open community with its own value system and its charter and its own uh, association, 
it will not <coughs> accept any kind of cooperation with market players. Right? So we see a huge shift as well, and I think this is very positive, that market players are changing their behaviors. And we have a shift to, not, none of this is directly related to peer-to-peer, -peer, but I think it somehow is related, you know, like fair trade or social entrepreneurship <coughs> or the Grameen uh, social business model. Uh, I think these are all indications of a pressure, uh, you know, that income-based, only profit-based, infant growth kind of strategies no longer really work, and so they need to move to, um, you know, and this is, uh, Adam is here, so Adam Arvidsson is writing a book about the ethical economy, I think this is part of uh, the things you're, you're writing about. Um, Okay, so I think these hybrid models will be the ones uh, that emerge. And I just want to kind of give you a indication uh, of what I think is the model that we may expect. And I think this is the theme of today, and you know why why you guys were and, uh, were invited, basically. Uh, so I think the you could actually change this. <coughs> so the the basic the core. The core of the new model, let's call it Industrial Revolution 2.0, is open design, and this is why we do it in Manchester, by the way, right? Uh, which is the, the, the birthplace of the first Industrial Revolution. And we are in a pretty similar situation as Marx when he started writing about you know, the workers, right? There's just a few tens of thousands, maybe hundreds of thousands of us at present engaging in, in, in peer production, but yet we kind of feed in our bones that this is the future. Right? And at the same time, Marx was, there were only a few tens of thousands of workers when he started writing, but yet he knew that this was a future society in the making. So this is kind of why we're here in Manchester. So the core will be open design communities, shared design communities. And of course, if you want to share designs, open designs, you need platforms, right? You need common standards, open standards, protocols, you know, how do I change this document? All that kind of stuff. So we have the design commons, both people and designs using platforms, right? So this is the kind of the core of innovation in R&D. Around that, we have entrepreneurial coalitions. So companies start forming on the basis of those commons. And they, and they start, uh, like Arduino, for example, share designs, and then they, they make and sell the physical product, right? But there's some kind of interflow between the open design and shared design communities and a set of companies which actually make them. Um, and then, this is perhaps more controversial, but I think equally necessary, uh, is that we will have, or that, and that we need to, to, to strive for a new model of the state. I call this the partner state model. I, I want to give you an example of a, a city which I really liked in, the, in, the, in France, which is Brest in Bretagne. And um, if you go there, it's kind of ugly city. It was bombed in World War II, so the, all these social housing estates. It's not very pretty. Nature is very pretty, but the city is not very pretty. Uh, and so the, the city, the, the socialist uh, party which uh, runs the city there, decided to use virtual means to reinvigorate city life. Right? And, for example, any citizen in Brest can borrow computers, videos, audio material from kind of a library, a, techn a technological library. Uh, the citizens of Brest can get training, a very intensive training program for teachers, for users, for all kinds of you know, <coughs> intensive training programs in, in the literacy of technology. Um, every NGO Every music band, every street performing group, because there are lots of them in, in the region, uh, can put its videos on a local YouTube and a local Flickr. So they've created their own local infrastructure for cultural exchange. Right? Okay, w one example how this works. So they have these smuggling routes, which are very popular with tourists. So one group is doing taking pictures. One group is taping birds. One group is doing oral history. Right? And the city then invests in multimedia kiosks. They were planning to, I don't know if they've done it yet, but anyway, that, that was the plan. They, they, they were planning in, in multimedia kiosks so that 
those things would be available to tourists as they travel on these smuggling routes, right? So this is important as a model because what happens there, it's not the government doing it. It's not privatization. It's the state, the public authorities of the city, enabling and empowering social production. And why would they do that? Well, because it creates value, right? Because a commons, a shared design commons, creates value. And we know location still is important. So, for example, uh, this, I don't know if there's anybody from Arduino here, but this is a story I heard from an Arduino person in, uh, in Milan when I was visiting Adam. And, and the, the, the anecdote is the following. So anybody can make Arduino circuit boards. The designs are open. So Chinese companies are making and selling Arduino companies. But because they're a little selfish, they don't do anything on the project. Well, the fact is, at least in open hardware, if you don't do any development work, you don't really know how it really works either. So, yes, you do have a design, but the fact that you don't participate actually results in substandard design. So the paradox is that the clients of Arduino circuit boards start demanding made in Italy uh, stamps encoded on the circuit board because they know this is good quality because these people actually know what they're doing they're contributing to the commons, right? <coughs> now, since we're talking about China, I think this is a, a really uh, interesting phenomenon as well. Um, I think it's called the Shanzai manufacturing uh, uh, trend, right? And two minutes, all right. Okay, so we end with that. It's basically, I, I'm using this as, as to show that how real this model already is, right? So iPhone did not succeed in having an agreement with a Chinese telecommunication company. So... <coughs> Legally, you could not find any iPhone in China. Yet you find them everywhere, right? So part of the answer, of course, is illegal imports. I'm sure there's quite a bit of real iPhones. Another part of the answer is locally produced fake uh, iPhones, right? And the idea, of course, is they reverse engineer the iPhone, right? They have bills of materials which they give to their industrial partners and these are open designs, right? This is this is the design of the iPhone, the reverse engineered design of the iPhone. And therefore, there's a whole ecology of businesses created. And of course, in China, you can you, they apply this to everything: bicycles, Ferraris. I mean, you can buy basically anything. They even have fake uh, skyscrapers, uh, reverse engineered skyscrapers. So they they have really they, what they practice is illegal open designs. And it works, and it creates a huge industry, right? So the argument is that if you can do it illegally, how much more efficient would that model be? It will be a legal model, right? If they start understanding that they can actually, instead of doing the iPhone, they can do the O phone. And actually, they're doing it, right? They're starting with the O phone now. So this hopefully will be an open design alternative to the iPhone that will be based on the model that we're discussing uh, today. So I, I should kind of conclude. Uh, yeah, um, thank you so much, I, I guess I'm. Yeah, all right. So no, no, don't worry, don't worry. Thank you. I'm <laughs> thank aware you. of the time, and we actually have 15 minutes uh, to get ourselves organised. What I'm thinking is, we've got an hour scheduled after the next uh, set of panels for discussion, uh, facilitated by Sophia. Sophie, sorry, uh, here. Um, you probably get that a lot, don't you, Sophia? Sophie, sorry. Okay, cool. Um, so what I was going to say was, if you've arrived, I've got some programmes. I'm going to put.